of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Mr. Oliver D. Shooter to Bangladesh. A very warm welcome to everyone attending here in Dhaka and also to those joining us via the live stream on YouTube. Oliver D. Shooter and his team have been in Bangladesh since 17 May and have visited Dhaka, Rangpur, Purigram, and Cox's Bazar, assessing the situation of poverty as well as uh, the steps being taken to address it. Mr. D. Shooter will today present us with his preliminary findings from the visit and recommendation to the government. Copies of Mr. D. Shooter's end of mission statement will be circulated here and uh, also available online in English and Bengali on the Special Rapporteur's website, srproverty.org. Press photographs are also available to download at that uh, at the same website, same website. Following Mr. D. Shooter's presentation, I will be opening the floor for questions here in the room and also via YouTube where you can already add your questions to the box. Mr. D. Shooter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and a warm welcome to all. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, press conference at which I will provide certain preliminary observations based on my 12 days visit in the, in the country. As you know, special officers are appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council as independent experts to report on certain uh, topics, uh, thematic areas, such as, in my case, extreme poverty. And we do this in Tiralia by these country visits uh, that we perform at the invitation of the governments concerned, who, by inviting special rapporteurs, show their willingness to cooperate with the United Nations human rights system. So let me start by uh, expressing my gratitude towards the government of Bangladesh for having cooperated thus with the United Nations human rights system by inviting me to this country. I'd like to um, thank all the uh, public officials whom I met at different levels of government for their willingness to engage with me. And of course, I would like to thank the many civil society groups, non-governmental organizations, academics, unions, and people living in poverty who shared with me their lived experiences and allowed me to better understand the challenges facing this country. The visit was facilitated thanks to the Office of the United Nations Resident Coordinator and to the logistics support from the UNDP let me again thank them for their support. Bangladesh has been making tremendous progress in the fight against poverty in recent years. Um, it is measuring this progress by using two poverty lines. One is the up poverty line, uh, measuring poverty. The other is the lower poverty line, measuring extreme poverty. Under the upper poverty line measure, the country has uh, reduced poverty from 48.9% of the population in 2000 to today 18.7%. Extreme poverty, the below poverty line measure, has shown uh, equally impressive uh, results. In 2000, extreme poverty was 34.3% of the population, more than one third. Today, it is 5.6%. And these are measures from the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, with whom I had extremely interesting exchanges on their um, regular preparation of the household income and expenditure surveys. Uh, this is um, quite remarkable. Um, the general progress of the country is uh, to be um, uh, saluted as a major achievement. At the same time, general figures say little about how people in poverty uh, experience their condition. And of course, not all society have benefited equally. First of all, we see that at the same time that poverty is being reduced, poverty has increased, which uh, means 
but the government perhaps should do more to make sure that economic growth uh, benefits equally all parts of the population. And secondly, um, much of this is fragile because many households are just above the poverty line and have not been able to make savings and accumulate assets allowing them or climate related shocks. It is striking, for example, that in a survey concerning um, the capital city of Dhaka, um, 51 of people in poverty had recently fallen into poverty as a result um, of the COVID-19 pandemic and of uh, recently um, um, increased costs of living, particularly inflation of food prices. Um, in other terms, the general progress is real, but it remains fragile. More importantly, perhaps, in my stay in the country, I spoke to many NGOs, to many unions, to human rights defenders, to members of the Dalit and Ashi communities. And I am very concerned that many of them live in a climate of fear. Um, the Digital Security Act that was adopted in 2018 is a legislation that is ostensibly meant to address the risk of terrorism. It is, in fact, misused to harass academics, think tanks, NGOs, um, under various pretexts that make it difficult to maintain a vibrant civic space and to hold the government accountable. Between civic space, the ability for unions and NGOs to function on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other hand. You cannot expect a government to invest for the people, to invest in healthcare, in education, in social protection, in if the government is not held accountable. You cannot expect corruption to be addressed effectively if people cannot um, ask the questions that disturb and cannot protest peacefully for their rights. You cannot expect wages to increase to provide workers with a decent standard of living if unions are repressed and unable to exercise their rights. And therefore, um, I, together with other special procedures of the Human Rights Council, and as um, already expressed by uh, the United Nations High Commission of Human Rights, Ms. Michelle Bachelet, when she visited the country, we are very concerned about the Digital, Digital Security Act and relieved that the government is um, taking the critiques into account. I hope that, that act can, can be uh, 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 significantly reformed and in the interim its uh, implementation suspended. It is important also to realize that for economic and social rights to be realized and in order for poverty to be reduced, um, in the term, um, groups within the country should be protected from discrimination. Today, the framework against discrimination is still incomplete. An anti-discrimination bill is pending before Parliament. I encourage Parliament to examine this as soon as possible in order to provide the Dalit, the Adivashi, the linguistic minorities such as the Bihari and others, including sexual minorities, with better protection. For the moment, um, this is still and it should be part, again, of the priorities of the country. The third precondition for sustainably combating poverty and to ensure that this general progress made by the country is sustained over time is that the collection of domestic resources should be improved. The country has, in recent years, witnessed a very um, impressive economic growth seven to eight percent over the past five, six years. Um, yet, it still has a fiscal system that is not equipped to ensure that this growth benefits all parts of society equally. 
the tax to GDP ratio remains very low at 7.8.8%. In other words, not enough public revenue is collected from the wealth that is created by economic growth. And secondly, um, indirect taxes that consumers pay um, represent almost two thirds direct taxes representing uh, about one third. This proportion should be reversed. The tax base should be enlarged and um, a much more progressive taxation system should be put in place. That, of course, requires that um, the transition from the informal to the formal economy be accelerated and that tax collection improves. Without this, it will be difficult to finance public services to support people's access to health, education, and social protection. As you know, the country will uh, be soon graduating from um, its current status as a least developed country in the UN terminology. This marks the successful um, development of the country over the past decades. It is a remarkable achievement. But the loss of LDC new challenges. It will be less easy for the country to benefit from certain um, types of financing because it will be less a priority country. And it means that the country will uh, have fewer preferential preferences in access to foreign markets. Um, it will not be able to continue to benefit from access um, quota free and tariff free to the EU, to Canada, to the US. Uh, this is an opportunity for the country to rethink its model of development. And I focused my work in part on what it would mean for its export sector. But let me be very clear here. Although I will discuss the ready-made garment sector because of its importance to the economy of the country, it represents 82% of the export revenue of the country and employs more than 4 million workers, in other terms, supporting um, maybe 20 million people in the country, um, the working conditions outside the RMG sector are even worse in many ways, particularly in the informal sector of the economy where 85% of the workers um, are located. Um, and I spoke to many informal workers, to street workers who have to support uh, constant harassment by the local goons uh, or who have to pay bribes to police officers if they want to be able to continue to produce on the sidewalks. I spoke to uh, people who work in their home, workers who uh, are subcontractors uh, to, uh, to larger factories and who do not know who buys their produce and therefore cannot protest the very low prices they receive from intermediaries. So there are many issues in the local economy that deserve to be addressed and that should be a priority for the country. The reason I focus in my remarks on the ready-made garment sector is simply because um, of the importance in the export revenue of this, of this country, of that sector, and because I met with a large number of unions, um, workers, representatives, and indeed factory owners during my stay. What I can say here concerning the RMG sector is that the cost competitiveness of the garment exports from the country still continues to reside chiefly in the wages being relatively low. The minimum wage in the RMG sector has been set at per month since uh, 2019. The Minimum Wage Board has uh, reconvened a few days ago in order to examine whether this wage should be increased. And very clearly, such an increase um, should uh, be um, uh, decided as a matter of urgency. This is both because the costs of living have increased significantly since 2018 when the last revision took place. But it's also because the country can afford to better pay the workers in the RMG sector. In fact, for most of the garments that Bangladesh uh, produces, uh, the price that the 
suppliers uh, receive from the buyers are lower than what the buyers pay when they source from other countries. And although the unions demand uh, an increase of the minimum wage up to 23,000 taka per month, an independent NGO, the Asia Wage Floor Alliance, has calculated that in order to support a family of four, a worker in Dhaka would require 51,000 taka per month to meet the expenses of education, housing, healthcare. Um, in other terms, a significant raise is um, necessary. And um, that, I think, is responsibility of the Bangladeshi government, of the minimum wage board. But it also is a responsibility for the buyers. Now, since the Rana Plaza incident 10, year, 10 years ago, in April 2013, significant progress was achieved in improving the working conditions in the RMG sector. Health and safety has been improved, safety in particular. Um, many big brands have joined the international accord on um, fire safety and health and safety in the Bangladesh ready-made garment sector, and they have agreed to finance remediation efforts by their local suppliers in order to open the structure of the buildings, avoiding that building, buildings collapse on the workers, and uh, to better protect um, health and safety on the workplace. But little changes, and the big brands continue to play a very perverse role by imposing um, improvements in health and safety at work, and at the same time demanding to be provided with low-priced items that they then sell on high-value markets in the global north. I call others to do their part in order to improve not just health and safety, but the wages of workers in the RMG sector. And let me be very clear. Buying companies, the international brands, have a duty to practice due diligence across the supply chain. In the terms, they must ensure that human rights are complied with across the supply chain. And this means not only that workers should be protected from harassment, that their health and safety should be um, uh, protected, that no child labor should be tolerated. It also means that all workers should have a right to a fair remuneration, in other terms, to a living wage, allowing them to support um, themselves and their families, and this condition today is not complied with. This is the responsibility of the big brands. One is also the tax incentives that um, go to companies investing in the special economic zones, in the export processing zones, in the uh, four electronic high-tech parks that Bangladesh has established to attract investment. The most problematic uh, issue related to the development of these zones is that to this date, the Bangladeshi Labor Act of 2006 does not apply within export processing zones. So unions cannot operate. Workers can establish so-called welfare unions um, to improve working conditions somewhat, but unions cannot protest and cannot demand higher wages. I think this should be remedied, and the fact that the conditions of work, including the wages, are higher in the than in other parts of the economy is not an excuse for union rights not being upheld in violation of the ILO conditions on freedom of association, convention number 87, and on the right to collective bargaining, uh, ILO Convention number 98. I also believe a cost-benefit analysis should be made to ensure that the tax incentives benefiting investors in the special economic zones and the export processing zones amount to depriving the state from public revenue that it badly needs in order to finance public services and social policies. Um, I was very impressed to see um, the um, importance of the tax holidays benefiting companies who may be tempted to come to Bangladesh for five, six, or ten years, benefiting from these incentives and then depart from the country once 
these incentives disappear. And that is a big risk that Bangladesh is taking with the regime it has put in place. I also note that apart from um, the garment sector, one major source of foreign currency for the country is remittances from migrant workers. In 2022 alone, the equivalent of 22 billion US dollars were shipped back uh, to Bangladesh from migrant workers having migrated abroad. And the flux of out-migration is continuing. In 2022, more than one million people left the country in order to seek employment, particularly in the Gulf countries and in some, um, in some other countries um, um, such as uh, Jordan and others. The problem is that these migrants very often work in very um, difficult environments, may be subject to uh, abuse and exploitation countries that still have in place the kefala system. I strongly recommend more be done in order to protect these migrant workers from exploitation in the host country. For example, the host countries could be encouraged um, to um, ratify the most important conventions uh, that could protect these migrant workers, the 1990 International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of Migrant Workers and the Families, or the 2011 ILO Domestic Workers Convention, 169. I think that um, uh, would be important, and it would be important that these countries of destination abolish the Kefala system to avoid um, uh, putting migrant workers at risk. During my um, visit to the country, I spoke to many um, academics, experts, think tanks, unions, NGOs working on social protection, and I was very struck by uh, the patchy system of social protection the country has in place. In fact, the system of social protection has developed in a very ad hoc fashion. Um, supporting particular groups of the population, sometimes very narrowly defined, without any systemic or systematic view of whom should be covered against which life risks. So we have a patchwork of um, social protection schemes that are poorly coordinated with one another, that provide very low coverage in total, and that often provide very inadequate levels of benefit. And the system is very badly skewed towards a very narrow portion of the population. Most of the money, the lion's share of social protection, goes to the pensions for civil servants. And many others in the country are deprived of any form of social protection whatsoever. I was also struck by the fact that certain social protection schemes require that people be put on a list that is um, maintained by the local ward councillor uh, whose task is in Tiralia to identify families that um, are at risk of poverty, that are below the poverty line, and that therefore uh, deserve support under certain targeted schemes targeting vulnerable groups. The problem is if you don't have the right connections, if you don't vote in the place uh, where you reside, if you are considered to be of the wrong political affiliation, you will not be placed on this list. And many people I spoke to um, told me that in order to be on the list, either you must have the right credentials and the right connections, or you must pay a small bribe. And so in poverty who, can, who cannot pay that bribe, which, which not usually is worth a few months of allocations, will simply not benefit from social protection. So the system is not working as it is. And although the intentions of the government are sound, implementation is still failing. The intention of the government is to make the system much more rational, to extend coverage, to ensure all individuals in Bangladesh, every man, woman, and child, is covered life cycle perspective from all risks of life by um, 
protection schemes that go directly to the individual through the G2P, the government to people system um, of electronic payments uh, going through the mobile phones. Um, that is a, a promising objective, although some people uh, may be left out of this system and should have access to, you know, um, physical provision of support um, if they don't benefit from the electronic payment system, um, if they cannot manage the online applications. Um, um, but the, the, the social protection schemes in place, for the moment, are not um, the results um, they should deliver, and protection remains um, um, insufficient. Um, I therefore think this should be a priority of the government to increase levels of investment in social protection and to ensure that um, no one is left behind. During my stay in the country, um, one of my most moving experiences uh, was in Cox's Bazaar, where I uh, was able to meet with um, Rohingya refugees in the, in the 33 camps in which they are hosted um, nearby Cox's Bazaar. Um, as you know, 950, more than 950,000 Rohingya refugees, in fact, 977,000 today, have been um, uh, country, most of them in 2017, to escape genocidal acts committed by uh, Myanmar. These refugees uh, today live in these 33 camps that are fenced since 2019. 30,000 have been um, moved to the island of Basanchar. And I was shocked by what I saw. These people today depend entirely on humanitarian support. There are very few opportunities for these people to make income generating activities, although a new volunteers program was put in place, it only concerns a, a handful of refugees, really. And they are denied the right to have access to employment or the right to start a business. The UN agencies and NGO partners have launched an appeal through the 2023 Joint Response Plan for 876 million US dollars to be able to provide support to the Rohingya refugees, but also to 450,000 Bangladeshis um, from um, uh, the region um, who deserve humanitarian support. And the response of the international community has been grossly insufficient. Only 17 percent, 176 million US dollars, have been pledged to date. That is scandalous. Bangladesh should not be left uh, to shoulder the burden of the presence of the refugees on its own. Um, these agencies should be much better supported in their work. The World Food Program has forced in May to reduce the value of the food vouchers it gives from $12 per month per person to $10. And in the first, on the 1st of June, it will be reduced further to $8 in a context in which Food inflation this year was about 8%. That means that in the camps, children are undernourished, the rates of malnutrition will increase, the rates of stunting, stunting will increase, the development of the child in that context um, will be endangered, and the families are going desperate because they lack the perspective, given that they cannot to Myanmar, and they cannot um, um, uh, be um, interacting with the host community. This is, of course, a responsibility of the international community. It is also, in part, a responsibility of the government of Bangladesh. I very strongly encourage the government to seriously consider access to the employment market for the Rohingya refugees. This could have important effects on the local economy, allowing these refugees not only to depend less exclusively on humanitarian support, which is not sustainable, but also to contribute to the local economy, perhaps even to pay taxes if their work is in the formal sector. 
course, to buy from local producers as the World Food Program already buys. Uh, the World Food Program spends, uh, on average, about 10 to 12 million dollars each buying from producers to supply the shops within, um, within the camps. This is not only something I encourage the government to do, it is a human rights obligation to provide the right to work. The Rohingya refugees have been welcomed to Bangladesh, and Bangladesh should be congratulated for its generosity. But now that they are under the jurisdiction of the country, their human rights must be respected, and the first of these rights in this case is the right to work. Finally, I have, of course, been looking at climate change. And I did not want to duplicate what my esteemed colleague, the Special Rapporteur on Climate Change and Human Rights, Ian Fry, has been doing when he visited the country in, in September, September 2022. But I did look at the impacts of climate change. I spoke to people affected by the, um, the, 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 f the overflow of rivers uh, coming from the the char areas um, or from low-lying um, areas of the country that are regularly subject to flooding. I spoke to people who had been migrating to Dhaka because they could not continue to cultivate crops because of the salinization of the water on which they depended. I spoke to people in the north, in Kurigram, who were affected by droughts. And the country has a very large number of climate migrants already to deal with, internally displaced persons who try to escape the impact of climate change. Bangladesh should receive much more support from the international community in developing and funding its adaptation strategy. Today, the, the Green Climate Fund is grossly underfunded by the rich countries. Not only they contribute too little to the fund, but in addition, the proportion of resources that go to adaptation as opposed to mitigation is grossly insufficient. And so Bangladesh is largely left um, on its own in, in, in having to cope with the impact of climate change. So I encourage um, um, rich countries to do much more to support Bangladesh, which is really on the front line of climate change and must receive much more support to deal with this challenge. At the same time, Bangladesh is aware that um, more needs to be done for the internally displaced within the country. Um, we have uh, uh, today um, more than 10 million people in the country who have been displaced as a result of, of climate change, and, and this figure will continue to increase. Some of them have migrated to informal settlements in Dhaka. Where they arrive, they have no social connections. They sometimes have no officially recognized address. As a result, they cannot vote, and they cannot convince the local ward councillor uh, to provide them support. And um, they have no family networks sometimes to fall back upon, as they did in their villages of origin. So we have a large number of climate migrants in the country that face uh, a desperate conditions. In addition, in some cases, they live in informal settlements without a, 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 a legal uh, title uh, protecting them from evictions. I met uh, uh, with some uh, communities uh, uh, victims of that um, um, insecurity of tenure um, who told me about that uh, difficulty. So, um, these are some of the findings I arrived at and some of the recommendations I um, have made to the government. Um, after this visit, I will um, uh, return uh, to, to Geneva and uh, work will start on preparing the final report and uh, work will start on preparing the final report of the visit. This final report will be uh, presented in draft form uh, to the government, uh, for the government to provide its comments, and then it will be officially presented in June 2024 at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Between now and then, in the next 12 months, I will continue to follow developments within the country. I will encourage the government to um, uh, base its future work uh, on the recommendations I am making. 
um, I will continue to receive submissions from unions, um, NGOs, human rights defenders, academics in this country. And I very much hope that the, the progress that has been um, so remarkable so far can be built upon uh, so that everyone can benefit. With this, I would like to thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. D. Shooter, for your valuable statement. Dear media friend, we are taking questions. Firstly, we take three questions. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me, Mufajal, please come and support us. Yeah. There's a microphone here. Microphone. Please uh, name your uh, name first and uh, uh, mention your house name and ask briefly, okay? Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Sharir Zaman. I'm a reporter working in Bangla Tribune. Uh, you said that you were shocked that uh, Rohingyas are not allowed to work. Uh, I am really shocked as you are talking about human rights, right? Uh, the ultimate human rights of Rohingyas is the repatriation. No mention about that. That's the first point. And the second point is um, you also said that out of uh, $876 million, only 17% were materialized or procured. Would you urge the international community to increase their contribution instead of putting burden on Bangladesh, which is also burden? Uh, I'd like to point out that when the Rohingyas will work, definitely the local community, they will lose their work. So what is the human rights of our Bangladeshi people who will lose their job? So, when you make the final report, please mention also that. Thank you. And also, these two questions, uh, that human rights of repatriation and also the contribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Excellency, my name is Mohsin. I work for Delhi Shamokal. I mean, after uh, listening to your remark, I mean, so many questions to ask, but I will stop by asking two. I mean, after uh, listening opening, uh, you, I mean, your opening remark, it gives me a feel like what the government basically claim regarding reducing the poverty in Bangladesh, that actually and statistics not basically happen in the ground. Uh, do, you, uh, do you understand me? Yeah. So uh, my question is, I mean, what actually uh, you basically uh, observed the situation? I mean, uh, is those statistics basically made, I mean, published by the government regarding the success of reducing poverty line and other things? Is those true? And my uh, another question regarding you basically ask uh, for 51,000 taka uh, for this RMG sector's minimum wage. I mean, I can bet uh, in this room, except this UN personnel and uh, seven, eight journalists may be getting more than 51,000, except every single one is having lower wage. So are you asking the government uh, for this minimum wage for only uh, for those RMG workers or for all? And, and do you have any statistics? Uh, what is the minimum? I mean, the average wage in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Panto, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just a supplement on the uh, poverty issues. I mean, Please name your uh, my house. Name is, my name is Panto Rahman. I work for a television channel, uh, Channel A. Uh, mm, uh, you mentioned that poverty level uh, decreases uh, to some extent and uh, increases the, uh, uh, you know, the discrimination or kind of uh, kind of you know the gap between uh, income, uh, right? In income in in inequality. So uh, can you just draw a straight line? What actually your observation uh, from your uh, uh, from this trip, from your trip, a straight line uh, on 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 uh, poverty level where actually Bangladesh is now? Yes, thank you.
Oh, okay, so let me perhaps answer these questions. There were more than three, but that's very welcome, and some are uh, slightly overlapping. Um, so first of all, on the repatriation of the Rohingya, yes, I did mention this. I, I, I think it's the long-term prospect, which I hope will be possible uh, as soon as possible. As you know, the conditions for repatriation are not uh, present at the moment. The Rohingya um, rightly expect first to be able to return to their lands that they occupied before fleeing the country. Secondly, they expect to have citizenship rights in Myanmar that Myanmar is refusing to provide to them. And thirdly, they expect that security conditions be met. For the moment, if they return to Myanmar, they risk their lives and, and security. And so um, no one believes today repatriation is, is realistic, but I, I, I do believe that Myanmar sh should bear the responsibility for this and, and that it, it more pressure should be placed on Myanmar to make the country much more hospitable to the Rohingya. But yes, that, that should be the long-term prospect, absolutely, and the Rohingya would not certainly not disagree with this. The support to the Joint Response Fund of the um, agencies working um, around the Rohingya, the Rohingya um, I mentioned, I think I was very explicit on this, the need for the international community to do much more. I deplore the fact that international donors uh, are not doing more. This crisis was high on the agenda of the international community in 2017, but now it's below the radar. Uh, that is not acceptable. And I, I, I reiterate my demand, indeed my expectation, that the donors wake up to their responsibilities in this regard, absolutely. That being said, I think um, providing access to work for the Rohingya would not deprive the local population from employment opportunities. It would actually create employment opportunities. Many of these Rohingya could be, um, um, uh, could, could be paid incomes that could be re-injected in the local economy. Some could start businesses and, um, and, and create a, a, a dynamic um, southeastern part of the country. And um, many studies uh, show that um, these multiplier effects can be significant and more than compensate for whatever uh, competition uh, there may be for uh, jobs in the, in the country, in the region. Um, on the statistics uh, on poverty, I have great respect for the work of the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics. They have a very robust um, methodology to assess progress in the fight against poverty. And I think we are all impressed by the progress achieved so far that uh, the household invest, um, uh, income and expenditure surveys uh, demonstrate. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, just to take one figure, which I'm repeating, in 2000, extreme poverty was 34.3% in the country. It is now down to 5.6%. That's remarkable as achievement, absolutely. But you know, as Special Rapporteur, my job is also to look at uh, what lies ahead in terms of challenges, the outstanding problems that remain, and that is um, the, the, the reason why I focused on, on other issues than these general figures. In fact, I encouraged the Bureau of Statistics, who agree, that in the future they may wish to move beyond um, income and expenditure surveys to look at multi-dimensional poverty. In other terms, looking also at nutrition, education, healthcare, um, um, housing, um, beyond the question of income alone. Um, it may well be that your incomes increase, but if, for example, the f school fees you have to pay or the, or the hospital fees you have to pay increase, um, you will find yourself uh, uh, not better off but worse off. And the Bureau of Statistics agrees that multidimensional poverty should be addressed in the future in their work. I also encourage them to disaggregate indicators by, by gender, by age, by ethnicity, um, uh, in order to address the question of disparities, potential disparities between different groups in the country. Um, on the question of the, the, the wages that should be paid to the <laughs> workers, most of whom are women in the RMG sector. This was your question. Um, uh, what the unions demand is 23,000 taka, which is uh, almost tripling the 
the current level of minimum wage, although the current average wage paid in the sector is, is not 8,000, which is the minimum, it's, it's around 10 to 12,000. That is for the, for the compliant factories. There's also a group of you know, um, non-compliant factories where wage theft is common and where wages may be below the minimum wage without this being very easy to assess. Um, and I'm in a delicate position because on the one hand, I do understand that the costs of living have increased and that for many workers in the RMG sector, it is difficult to live even with uh, nine, 10,000 taka. On the other hand, I know that many people in the country are in a very dire situation, would like to be employed in the RMG sector, where at least people get paid on a regular basis, right? Although I should say that when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, many international brands just canceled their orders, did not take responsibility for this. 150 factories temporarily closed and laid off workers who were without any revenue. And that, I think, is completely irresponsible, showing the need to bring these international brands to account in order for um, the industry to be, uh, to be able to, to provide much more protections to the workers, including by increasing the level of wages. But if your question was, um, uh, is the situation worse in other parts of the economy? Of course it is. And I met with many people uh, who are informal workers, um, often self-employed, um, um, living on really poverty wages, barely able to survive, um, who indeed um, manage with, with even uh, low levels of income. Um, um, the reason I discuss RMG workers is uh, simply because I have uh, lots of information on this, visited factories, spoke to people. So um, um, as um, others, um, I, have, I, I depend on the information I receive to provide a full picture of the situation in the country. Um, I think I, I, I responded to the questions that were raised. If I haven't, please uh, don't hesitate to call me back to answer. Uh, thank you for three next questions. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, you uh, said that the progress made in uh, the country is uh, very fragile. Uh, so why is that? Uh, and uh, what is your recommendation? And over the years, of course, Bangladesh has made a lot of uh, progress in terms of infrastructure development. Yeah. Uh, how do you assess that? Whether it is imbalanced as there is less investment in uh, social sector. Uh, this is number one. And the other one is you said, uh, you mentioned about Digital Security Act. You said that because of that, uh, people are not able to cushion uh, when there is corruption and things like that. Would you please elaborate? Thank you. DBC, DBC. I just, I, just, I, just, yeah. I just added, do you have any suggestion about uh, in this regard, in the Digital Security Act? Do I have any, sorry? Uh, do you have any suggestion uh, to our uh, government? Hello. Please name your name and this how This is Moshe Hasib. I work for Channel 24. So my question is, you talked about the safety, social safety net, uh, which has been allowed by the government, and you also talked about these facilities only get by those general people who are well connected to the local commissioners. So this is our, our local leaders. Well, that's a quite a, quite a good uh, uh, observation, but I'd like to know what is the sample size you really talked about? How many people you really talked about? Uh, because uh, is this, uh, is this uh, about a particular area or this is a whole scene of the whole Bangladesh? Do you or your observation team or your research team have that particular database? They have talked out of 180 million people, like 5 million, 6 million, stuff, stuff like that. Do you mind mentioning the number? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for these questions. The first question is about what I call the fragile nature of the progress so far. What I meant by this is that um, many households who are now above the poverty line um, 
are just above the poverty line and don't have um, assets that allow them to, uh, to withstand a shock. For example, the loss of a job, um, a funeral uh, to be paid for when a parent dies, or um, a, a wedding to be paid for when a child marries, uh, or indeed, uh, the loss of a home if a cyclone strikes, uh, or, or the loss of uh, one harvest if you're a farmer uh, living in a climate-exposed area. And so we are in a situation now where many people have been lifted out of poverty, but have, have not been able yet to build enough savings to be able to withstand such shocks. That's what social insurance and social protection is all about. It's to protect people from these life shocks. And this is why social protection is so important. In fact, one of my recommendations to the government is that um, beyond the normal risks that are usually discussed, unemployment, um, illness, old age, um, maternity, etc., uh, a new risk should be um, uh, taken into consideration to provide a new kind of insurance, and that is the risk from climate disasters. Right? So it is in that sense that um, the, 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 the progress remains fragile. Um, one way to deal with this is to look at not only income inequalities, but also wealth inequalities, and to introduce in different forms a, a wealth tax. In other terms, not only to tax income uh, generated by uh, work uh, um, in particular, but also to, to tax the, the, those who've been able to accumulate wealth in order to have a, a, a redistribution uh, to those who have nothing to fall back upon in times of crisis. And this could mean, for example, taxing inheritance, um, um, or it could mean introducing a, a higher property tax. Uh, but it's not for me to make that decision. It's for me to draw the attention to potential ways, or, or to draw the attention to potential issues that, that could be addressed. And, and yes, I think building resilience is important. Um, there was a question on, on the investments the country has made in physical infrastructure. Um, I, 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 I think this is really important. Lots of um, investment was uh, made in maintaining or constructing roads and, and, and bridges. Um, 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 I know that uh, there's a very important project uh, together with um, India and Nepal to build a dam for hydroelectric power. I think this is fantastic. Um, most of the people I spoke to from um, think tanks um, and academia Consider, however, that uh, there was an overemphasis on physical infrastructure and an underemphasis on human capital development. Ultimately, how can Bangladesh succeed in a knowledge economy in which skills will matter more and in which the, the, the fact that many Bangladeshi learn English in schools is a huge asset for the country? Bangladesh will succeed by investing in its people. That means investing in high quality education. It means investing in healthcare. It means investing in social protection so that the parents are not forced to marry the girls early or to force the teenage boys to go to work. That is how Bangladesh can succeed, investing in its people. And perhaps less investment in the future should go to building dams and bridges and more should go to investing in people's uh, ability to learn and to uh, be competitive in a knowledge economy. So um, that is, I think, what I, what I believe should be the next priorities. Um, let us not forget that at the same time that Bangladesh is building these roads and, and these dams uh, and these bridges, um, um, child marriage remains hugely important in the country and early school dropout is significant at secondary level of education. That is not normal. This is a country that will graduate from LDC status, and you still have a large number of kids who at 13, 14 years old are, rem are removed from the schools by their parents because their parents cannot pay for the cost of education and need them to work uh, on the fields. Um, that, I think, is, is deeply problematic. There is a modern Bangladesh that is succeeding, and there is one that needs more support. On the Digital Security Act, the question was, 
which are the suggestions? Well, um, I, I, I discussed this uh, with the, the, the government and particularly with the, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I am not the first uh, UN uh, um, expert to express my concern over the Digital Security Act. Um, today, um, when one seeks information about um, suspected um, uh, misuse of funds by public officials, for example, sometimes using the Right to Information Act, you may be, excu uh, you may be accused um, of uh, uh, defaming the government um, and, and of other such offenses under the, the, the DSA. Um, according to one count um, from one think tank, 2,400 uh, plus people have been um, uh, prosecuted, accused under the DSA since uh, the start of the legislation, the entry into force of the legislation. Uh, some of them have been detained for long periods of time before they could obtain um, their release from the higher courts. This is not normal. It is not normal that people who fight for human rights live in a climate of fear and intimidation. And the DSA is routinely abused by some prosecutors and therefore it should be fundamentally rethought and I recommend suspending the DSA until it is um, 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 significantly improved in order to do what it should do, which is combat uh, terrorism effectively, um, but not uh, be a, a Damocles sword weighing uh, above the heads of human rights defenders. Finally, there was a question on um, the, 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 the bribes uh, that were demanded from local um, uh, councillors um, in order to benefit from certain social protection schemes. Uh, this is widespread, although it's not systematic. And to answer your question, sir, I'm not um, in a position, nor do I have the resources to do large longitudinal surveys to examine this. My evidence is anecdotal. But I did speak to hundreds of people across the country, and quite a few told me about the sums they had to pay, which may sound minor, um, but which are significant for people in poverty. So um, five, 6,000 taka to benefit, for example, from the vulnerable, groups, uh, from the vulnerable group development uh, program that supports widows and abandoned women, or vulnerable group feeding programs. Um, this may sound like not much money, but f for families who, who live on extremely low incomes, it is a sum that they cannot afford, and it results in a paradoxical situation in which the people who would need the most to be supported are the least in a position to have access to that kind of support. But my evidence, I, I absolutely acknowledge this, is not um, based on the scientific um, uh, survey providing, based on the representative sample of the whole population of Bangladesh. I would urge the government to do more on this issue nevertheless. Okay. Uh, last three questions from this side. Yeah, any question this side? Okay. Uh, uh, Shooter, just uh, I want to uh, know something about uh, the uh, wages of the even volunteers who are working in the Cox Bazaar camps because uh, you have just mentioned about uh, the WFP decision to reduce the monthly food grants for the refugee, which is now perhaps ten dollar right now. So what is the uh, there is a huge criticism about the uh, big salaries of the UN volunteers. So my guess is that uh, this ten dollar is just one hour uh, or uh, thirty uh, half an hour income of an UN volunteer. So, on the human rights angle, how do you assess the situation? Where this is a huge discrimination, and and if the UN volunteers can, you can reduce your own wages, you, it could surplus the grants for the refugees. 
Am I clear? I, I'm not sure I got the question. I know the question is about the, the volunteer program of the... Of no, 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 the I'm asking about the UN, the UN expenditure, the, on account of the salaries of the UN volunteers, is huge. And, 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 and so, you know, what, what do you recommend, uh, whether they should reduce their salaries to provide better support to the refugees? I mean, you have mentioned it's ten dollar only for a month for the food bill, which is a half an hour salary of an even volunteer. Right. There, is this a realistic situation, or acceptable on the human rights angle? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, th that was last questions. Okay. Look, I, I have no comment to make on this. I I am. Uh, this is a question to be asked maybe to, to the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees or the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. These people work under, under difficult conditions, having, you know, spending time um, abroad and, and the UN wages are what they are. I have not decided on these wages. I myself am a volunteer, so I don't, I'm not paid for what I do. Um, I do this because I believe in the power of human rights, and um, I, I, I am the first one to say that um, the, the refugees deserve much more support. Um, um, but, the, but the salaries are a minuscule um, portion of the total um, support that the, 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 the weight of the salaries are a minuscule portion of the total cost of hosting refugees in, in the camps near Cox's Bazaar. But frankly, I, have, I don't have any figure to provide, nor indeed any sensible reaction to your question. Uh, this is a question you may ask to UNHCR. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody and colleagues. Uh, uh, we are closing the press conference. We have a tea and coffee in the lobby. Thank you, everybody. Please take your uh, press release copy. Okay. We are distributing press release copy. Okay. We have print copy. Thank yeah. You. I love the country, yeah. I, 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 I didn't know Bangladesh before coming here, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I